فلينذر من آمن بالله واليوم الآخر والملائكة والكتاب والنبيين وآت المال على حبه ذوي القربى واليتامى والمساكين وابن السبيل والسائلين وفي الرقاب وأقام الصلاة وآت الزكاة والموفون بعهدهم إذا عاهدوا والصابرين في البأساء والضراء وحين البأس أولئك الذين صدقوا وأولئك هم المتقون صدق الله العظيم quality of the human being, that every person in the world realize that these are bad qualities, and there are some that are known to be good, a person does not have to have a religion, does not have to study a book, does not have to recite any divine book before knowing that this is bad and this is good. And I think one of these most obvious ones is truthfulness. That people of every country, denomination, religion, background, they all realize that truthfulness is a good quality and the opposite of that, which is lying, is a bad quality. When you talk to someone about truthfulness and you tell the person what lying is bad, you don't have to quote ayahs of the Qur'an, you don't have to quote a hadith, you don't have to quote verses from their books, or you don't have to quote the sayings of saints and elders and religious people or prophets before you can convince the person that lying is bad. In fact, you take the worst criminal. And if you talk to them about lying, the person may say, yeah, I won't lie. You take the most illiterate people, people who have no education whatsoever, they have not studied anywhere, they may be living in jungles and they don't even know how writings are and how to read alphabets, but they also realize and understand that lying is a bad one. With such an obvious thing, there is a very amazing hadith. When Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, تأتي على الناس سنوات الخدعات A time will come when there will be a period of time, سنوات, years, period of time. It's not only a few days or some special situation. <laughs> there will be a period of time when these things will all be forgotten about and in fact the understanding of these things will be totally twisted. يُصَدَّقُ فِيهَا الْكَاذِبُ وَيُصَدَّقُ فِيهَا الصَّادِقُ In those, in that period of time, the situation would be that truthful people would be considered to be liars. And the liars will be considered to the best sources of information. Now, if a person goes back 1400 years to the time of Rasulullah and he's kept thinking, how is it possible? I mean, everyone knows lying is lying. And if you say the truth, that's very obvious that this is the right thing to do. How could be that the situation would change throughout the world? Rasulullah is not saying 
that this will happen in a group of people. He says this will become the situation of the world that in this world there will be a period of time before Qiyamah when all of these things will be totally twisted and misunderstood and the sign of that time would be that the truthful people are considered to be liars. And the liars are considered to be the best source of information and the most reliable source of information. وَيَنْتِقُ فِي هَذِ الرُّوَيْدِ He mentioned another sign. And he says in those days, days Ruwaydi Allah will speak. So Sahaba Ridwan Allah Ali Majmain asked Ya Rasulullah, what does Ruwaydi Allah mean? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, people who are totally ignorant about deen, they will talk regarding the situation of the Ummah. They will be making decisions for the Ummah of what Ummah should be doing now. That's what was the situation during those days. If we just sit for a minute by our souls and start thinking about what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is talking about. And what's happening in the world at this time. We will have no choice but to say, Ashhadu anna Muhammad al-Rasulullah. It's nothing but a sign of his prophethood that how could a person ever predict something like this, that this will become the situation of the world. That when people who are trustworthy, who are trustful people, when they talk about the situation of the Ummah, everyone will tell them, you you don't know what you're talking about, sit down. And I would love to hear things about their situation from people who don't even know a few hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sometimes, when we hear people who have done a lot of research, people who have done a lot of research regarding the situation of the world, when they start speaking up regarding their research and their findings, and people are so attentive, and they are coming up with point after point, you know, this is how things are, this is what happened, and this is the result of it, and this is the reason for it. And sometimes when we hear these type of things, and I'm sure all of us in the same situation, that when we listen, when we hear those type of restrictions, it's nothing more than a joke for us, and you just sit and laugh that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned the real reasons for these problems 1400 years ago and it's being very clearly stated in Quran and Korean, black and white, everything is there and here this person is poor guy is spending so many years of his life, wasting his time and still at the end he's not able to come up with the right conclusion and then everyone is listening to it as this is everything this is the reality, yes this is what it is now let me give you some examples. You read a hadith today to the people in the world. Right away there will be a question. Why did he see something like this? Why did the prophet see this? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And now there will, you will be bombarded with questions. If you are to go and speak at a place where there is a mixed gathering of Muslims and non-Muslims, You would be amazed that how many ahadiths would come to your mind, how many ayahs of the Qur'an may come to your mind, and you will have to leave those ahadiths, not mention them to public with a fear that people may not understand them and they will reject them. They will reject the ahadiths. Now, don't bring the hadith. Present another presentation that, look, Mr. Stephen came up with this research and he did put there is an organization that has spent 20 years doing all of this research. They spent $2 million on that research and this is the conclusion and this is what they came up with. And you see how people are listening to all of this. Yes, yeah, very good. These people did a great job. Woman, Who is the most 
who is more truthful than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's an ayah of Quran. We recite it, we go by it as if, okay, I know it. But it makes us wonder, what was the reason to mention this? Why Allah is mentioning it? Amazingly, we are at the time when we recite a word of Allah to people, even to those who believe in it, they will have questions about it. And when you recite, you, when you read something from the researches of the people, these people will take it as if this is the final word, yes, there is a lot of work done on it. You see a person walking outside, right away you realize this has to be a Muslim woman because she is covering her head. She is covering her head and she is doing it because she is instructed to do this by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we all know how many times we hear objections about those women. Why does she have to wear it? And those who are not doing it, who are not following it, they may even mock. إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ قَالُوا نَشْهَدُ إِنَّكَ لَرَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ إِنَّكَ لَرَسُولُهُ وَاللَّهُ يَشْهَدُ إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَكَاذِبُونَ And the surah, the name of the surah reveals the general message of the surah, and that is, this surah is about munafiqeen and their habits, their ways of life, the things that will make these people munafiqeen and got them out of being from the true believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this surah with a very amazing statement. And then, some munafiqeen came to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Nashhadu innaka la Rasulullah. Look at the word. We all say the same thing. Ashhadu anna Muhammad rasulullah so they went to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they said, Nashhadu an innaka la Rasulullah. We witness that surely you are the messenger of Allah. إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُنَافِقُونَ قَالُوا نَشْهَدُ إِنَّكَ لَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ We witness that surely you are the messenger of Allah. After revealing this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاللَّهُ يَعْلَمُ إِنَّكَ لَا رَسُولُ Allah says, I know that you are my messenger, but at the same time, as these munafiqeen are witnessing, Allah says, I also witness for something. وَاللَّهُ يَشْهَدُ إِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَكَاذِبُونَ Allah witnesses that munafiqeen are liars. Now, what is the lie about? Isn't this a truthful statement that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a messenger of Allah? Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling munafiqeen to be the liar? This is a very important fact that we need to keep in mind. That sometimes we reveal something different than what's in our heart. The person is saying something, and his heart believes something different. The person is witnessing for something, but he feels that he is not totally satisfied with it. You smile to someone. You are hiding anger into your heart. You are exchanging gifts with someone. That's a sign of love. But hiding hatred in the heart. The person that we smile to, 
the person that we will exchange gifts with, the people that we admire, on their back, on their back, we do so many things and we say so many things, that these things and those things, they do not match, they do not go together. Either you believe in this or you believe in this. You believe he is this good or you believe he is this bad. When you are in his presence, you said to him this. And you are smiling to him. In your heart, there was no smile to this person. Your heart did not accept this person. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying, I witness that these munafiqeen, when they come to you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they say, Nashhadu innaka la rasulullah, we bear witness that you are a messenger of Allah, I know that they do not witness for it in their heart. So, there is difference between what they are saying and what is in their heart, they are hiding in their heart, and therefore, this is a sign of nikah. This is considered to be a sign of nikah. And the person would hide something different in his heart than what he is revealing by his actions or by his words. And I'm sure we see this as a very general habit. And why is it so wedding? We walk in there with big guests. And we come out, and then we see what we say about those things. And we all know what type of comments we will be making about them. Either don't go over there with these guests, and don't give them these things, and don't show them that you love them. Or, if you want to do that, then we have to stop doing what we are doing on the other hand. But both of these things, they do not go together. Either this or that. Either we like the person or we don't like the person. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that nifaq, the basis of nifaq is lying. The root of nifaq is lying. Because Nifaq simply means a person is hiding something different in his heart than what he is revealing. Now, if this person does this to Allah and to the deen of Allah, he will be considered to be a munafiq. But, if a person is doing it to people like him, then this is considered to be the sign of Nifaq. That this person is carrying some of the behaviors of the munafiqeen, although he is not a munafiq, but he is carrying some of the behaviors of the Munafiqeen which, for which he will have to pay at the end. This is why. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in a hadith, أَضْمِنُوا لِي سِتْكَمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَضْمَنُوا لَكُمْ الْجَنَّةِ Guarantee me six things. I need a guarantee of six things from you people and then I guarantee you the Jannah. The Prophet of Allah is talking to all of us now. And he's saying that all of you, if you can guarantee me, any of you can guarantee me six things. I can guarantee, I, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, guarantee that I will hold your hand and take you into the Jannah. Subhanallah, what can be better than this? There is no insurance, there is no guarantee, there is no warranty better than this one that Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam will tell us that I guarantee you the Jannah, I'll make sure that you go straight to Jannah. The first thing, have the habit of always saying the truth. This is the first thing he mentioned. Always have the habit of speaking the truth. Be truthful all the time. Give away the line. Number two. وَأَدُّوا Always be trustworthy. Be in a situation where people can really trust you. Let people around you know that this person will not lie. He will not break his trust. He is a trustworthy person. I can trust him. Even if he does not like me, I still trust him. The situation of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he was in Makkah Mukarramah. If you remember, 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he was leaving for Medina Munawwara, and he was doing the hijrah, escaping from the kuffar of Quraysh, he had to leave Ali radiallahu anhu behind. For what purpose? He's keeping him in such a dangerous situation. For what reason? Ali, escape behind. And make sure tomorrow you return all of these stuff to their owners. The kuffar, those who are plotting against him day and night, when they are afraid of losing something, they come and give it to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. They are trusting Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam with it. There is no contract that is signed. There are no papers. There are no documents. Documents. There is nothing. But they come and trust Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Here, ya Rasulullah, you keep this for us. And he's not saying no. You know, you are my enemy. You don't like me, or you don't believe in me. I don't accept no. I'll take care of this. Don't worry about it. So now he's leaving from Medina Munawwara. He's not taking these things with him. Okay, well, if you need it, come back and take it from Medina Munawwara. No, he leaves Ali radiallahu anhu behind. Ali, these things belong to such and such person. Well, before you come to Medina, make sure you turn all of these trust to their owners. And then come to Medina. Always be trustworthy. Number three. Always fulfill your promise. Whenever you make a promise, make sure you fulfill that promise. Never, never break your promise. You need to remember one thing. From the Sharia point of view, breaking the promise refers to, at a time of making the promise, the person knows in his heart that I will not make it. We we'll pull our schedulers and our organizers and diaries and okay, I'm writing it down. And you know you won't make it. This is breaking the promise. But if you have your firm plan of fulfilling the promise, and all of a sudden something came up, you could not make it there. Some emergency came up and you could not go. This is not considered breaking the promise from the Sharia point of view, which means it's not the breaking of the promise that the Hadith talks about. There is no sin on this. Because it's out of person's control. Situations that rise up, all of a sudden there is a traffic. You could not get there on time. This is not considered breaking the promise. Breaking the promise when you intentionally don't make it up. Or, even at the time of promising you had the intention, later on, you change your mind and you do not inform the person. If at that time we had the plan that, okay, I'm promising him this, I'll give him $100 tomorrow. Or can you promise the person? Now, the next day, you know, all of a sudden, night time, you thought, no, I don't think I will be able to give it to him tomorrow. So you call the person, let the person know that, no, I won't be giving it to you tomorrow. It's not that soon. the next day, all of a sudden, the person will disappear. So, Breaking the promise when the person intentionally accepts playing games or he does not want to fulfill his promise and he does something for that, that is considered one of the major sins from the Sharia point of view that a person is breaking his promise. Number four, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, then, وَحْفَظُ فُرُوجَكُمْ Protect your private parts from committing any haram. Number five, Keep your gaze down, don't look at haram. Don't look at your haram, protect your eyes also from your sins. Number six, Control your hands from touching haram. And touching haram could be in two different ways. Number one, the person touches something that is haram. It's touching out of love or whatever that is. Number two, hitting someone. Hurting someone with our hands. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Control your hands and do not touch anyone with, in, in a wrongful way. Control your hands. Six things. These are the six, six things Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, If you promise me that you will fulfill these six conditions and you will control these six things, I promise you the Jannah. There are the hadith Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, if you have four things 
in you. You don't have to worry about anything that you don't have. If you have these four things, then you've got everything, every blessing of Allah in this dunya. Then don't worry about what you are missing. Because you've got everything real. You. If you have these four things. Number one. Sit up. Certain type of people in these ayahs. Starting with some advice for all of us. For you who believe. Ya ayyuhal nadina aman. Ati'u Allah wa Rasulah. Obey Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَلَا تَوَلَّوْا عَنْهُ وَأَنْتُمْ تَسْمَعُونَ Do not turn away from Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam while you are hearing it, while you are listening to the call of Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And don't be like those who said we heard, but never heard it. The worst people are those who hear and then turn away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah protecting His words from getting heard by these type of people. And if they would hear it, then still they are going to turn away from Allah and from the Book of Allah. This is the brief message of the ayah. Which means, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is calling us to it. Being attentive to the words of Allah. To the call of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And... Whatever we hear, we should put it into practice. This is the purpose of hearing it. Don't be like those who hear it and they are behaving as they never heard the words of Allah. Don't be like those who said we heard, but it looks like they never heard it. The whole purpose of the life is obedience to Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Anything goes out of that. It's away from the purpose of our life. It's distracting us from what we are supposed to be doing. Whenever we find ourselves doing something that we feel that is not, does not have any room in the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we should know that this is not what I'm supposed to do. Regardless of who can see me and who cannot see me, if my fear is I won't do this if other people are there, then don't do it for the sake of Allah. If the fear is I'm, I can't say these things at this time because these people are there, don't say even when these people are not there. Have you talked about Allah? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam giving us some examples of obedience to Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and disobedience. In a hadith which is in Sahih al Bukhari, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and basically this was a dream of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Sahabi who raised this dream, his name is Samurah ibn Jandub radiyallahu anhu. He says it was the habit of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that normally after Salat al-Fajr he would turn around and he would ask us, هَلْ رَأَى مِنْكُمْ أَحَدٌ مِنْ أَلَّيْلَ تَرُعِيَا Did anyone see a dream tonight? If there was a special dream that someone had seen, he would interpret the dream for those people. One of these days, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked, did anyone see a dream? And we said, oh ya Rasulullah. Which means, not an important dream. People may have seen dreams that they don't feel is worth it mentioning it to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, but today I saw something very amazing. I saw something very amazing. As I was laying down, two angels came to me. And they said to me, let's go. I said, where? They said, come on, just go with us. And I went. They took me up to the heavens. And they took me by a person that was laying down. 
And another person is standing next to him with a big rock, with a huge rock in his hand. And he throws the rock at the head of this person who is laying down. So this person shouts, cries. And he smashes his head by that rock into pieces. And he throws it so hard that the rock flies on a distance. By the time he goes to pick up that rock, brings it back, that person's head is being put together again, and again he goes the same thing to the person, he smashes his head with that rock. And again this person shouts, climbs. I said to the, and, and, and the and people with me, subhanAllah, Mahada, subhanAllah, what is that? Who are these two people? They said to me, Inqalaq, Inqalaq, let's go, let's go. We have to go furthermore. See some other things. So we continue the journey. And they took me to another man who was laying down on his back. And now there is another person standing next to him. He cuts his mouth. The person is standing has a very sharp knife, like a razor, and he starts cutting the mouth of this person who is laying down, standing from the opening of his mouth all the way up to his neck. And the person shouts. He cries. Then he cuts his nose, standing from his nose to his neck. Then he cuts his eye, standing from his eye all the way to his neck. He goes to the other side and does the very same thing to the other side. This person is crying. By the time he's done from the other side, the first side has been put together and he comes back and he does the same thing to him on this side. And he continues doing the same thing. I said to them, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Manadani, Subhanallah, tell me who are these two people? They said to me, Infalaq, Infalaq, let's go, let's go, there is something more to see. And they took me by a river of blood. The whole river is only blood. And there is a person swimming in that river trying to come out of it. <coughs> Imagine how much time can you spend in the dirty water? Forget about being in the river of blood. The person is trying to come out and another person is standing at the edge of the river. Whenever that person comes to the edge of it, he throws a rock at him that makes him fall back to the middle of it. He gets back into the middle of it, then tries to swim, 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 is struggling to come out, and again as he gets there, he throws the rock again at him, and he puts him back, throws him back to the middle of it. I said to them, Subhanallah, Mahadhan, Subhanallah, tell me who are these two people? He said to me, Impaliq, Impaliq, let's go, let's go, there is more to see. And then, took me to a very deep hole. When I looked into it, they asked me to look at it. When I looked into it, there was a fire, and there are a lot of naked men and women in there. They're getting burned into the fire. And fire is really boring, so it blows them up and then pulls them down, and they're burning, and they're getting up and down. But they are not able to come out of that hole, out of that ditch. They are just burning into the hole. So I asked them, Manhaula, who are all of these people? They said to me, Impaliq, let's go, let's go. There is more to see. And now, they take me to a place where there was a beautiful garden. A beautiful garden. A tall man is sitting in the middle of the garden against the tree. 
And there are a lot of children playing around this man. Who are all of these children? Who is this man? They said to me, Infalik, let's go, let's go, there is more to see. And finally, they take me to a city that had walls, city that was fenced with walls. But the wall, one brick is gold and the other brick is silver. This is how the whole wall is built of gold and silver. We got a permission to enter that city. As we got in there, I saw people. Half of them are burned. And the ugliest thing you have seen in your, in your life. This is half of their body. The other half is the most handsome person that you may have ever imagined in your life. Half good and half bad. So the two people with me, the said to those people, look, that you were going to the river and have a quick shower into the river. The one that had a dip into the river, as they came out, the whole body was perfect. Everything that was on the hat and on their head that was ruling their look and it was like, looked like it had, been, it had been burned down, the whole thing is gone. I said, who are these people and why? What happened to them now? They said, still, wait, wait, there is more to see. Let's go. Let us show you something else. And they asked me to look up. I looked up. There was a beautiful castle there. They said to me, that's your place. That's your castle. So I said, Sazarani, at once, allow me to go and have a look at it. They said, no. Not at this time. That time would come when you go, when you would go, get in there, but this is not your time to go in there. Now we have to take you back because your time is over. So I said, before you take me back, could you please tell me, give me some explanation of everything that we have seen in my That's a yes. The first person that you had seen, whose head was getting smashed by a rock, من يطع الرسول فقد أطاع الله ومن تولى فما أرسلناك عليهم حفيظا ويقولون طاع فإذا برزوا من عندك بيت طائفة منهم غير الذي تقول والله يكتب ما يبيتون فأعرض عنهم وتوكل على الله وكفى بالله وكيلا صدق الله العظيم informed us about how to be in the Ummah of Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What is our responsibility as followers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? How to obey Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? First thing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us one general rule. من يطع الرسول فقد أطاع الله. It's such an important order of Allah, such an important statement that when you look at it, as it tells us how to get close to Allah, it also informs us the status of Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم in the sight of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Whoever obeys the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, surely this person has obeyed Allah. Which means, when sometimes we feel that I can do the fara'id, 
And by doing the fara'id, I have obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us no. If you obey Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you have obeyed Allah. And if you disobey Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you have not obeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no way that a person can break the connection between the two. Then we can say, I'm pleasing Allah. And I don't have to fulfill the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In other ayahs of Quran al Kareem, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts the very same statement in different words. Inna ladina yakfuruna billahi wa rusuli. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about different groups of disbelievers. Those who disbelieve in Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Second group. This is the first group. They just believe totally up front. They say, we don't believe in Allah, we don't believe in Messenger of Allah. Second group of disbelievers. And they like to separate the connection between Allah and His Messenger of Allah to break that connection between Allah and the Messenger of Allah. We obey Allah, but we stay away from the Messenger. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the only way of getting to me is through my messenger. I have told you to obey my messenger, and that is the only way you would, you would know me. You would know how to obey me. You would know that what pleases me. Otherwise, you would be confusing your opinion. And I would not be pleased with the judge with your opinion. Reading the history of the previous nations, not from a book of history, from Quran al Karim. <coughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in Quran the details about the previous nations and especially the problems that they had that took them away from the deal of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about them. That majority of them, for the majority of those people of the previous nation, their deen is nothing more than just some thoughts and imaginations. Their deen is not based on the sayings of the Prophet وسلم, on the teachings of the Ambiya. Their deen are based on their imaginations. So I think this is what it should be. I think this is how it should be. So the whole thing is based just on these types of thoughts and imaginations. Whereas the purpose of Ambiya was to inform people very openly, upfront, clearly, that this is exactly how Allah wants these things to happen to take place. This is the exact method that will please Allah. Anything against it will just please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person would like to build a house. As soon as he applies for a permit, they tell him that we need a drawing. Now this person gets an architect who would draw the design of the house and then this person will be presenting that drawing to the city. The, the city approves the drawing. This person changes his mind and builds a house that's totally different than what it was on the drawing. Now the city comes after the person. He's being summoned to the court that you built a house that is not allowed to have in this area. In this area, we do not allow these type of houses that you have built. And you present it as a drawing, then we like it was approved, and we approved only that drawing. You went back and you changed your drawings. You made the changes, you built a different type of house, it is not acceptable. 
We will not allow this house to be over here. He has to demolish this house. Anbiya alayhi wa salatu wa salam they came and presented that drawing of a human being of a complete life of a human being that is approved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is what Allah wants from us. Very simple. Nothing is hidden there. Allah wants this, this and this. And this is how He wants these things to be established in our life. Now we see the drawing and we say, you know, I need to make a little change over here. I need to change the color over here. I need to change the sizes over here. Once we go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's going to match everything with the drawing presented by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if we build the structure of our life accordingly, or we have got some different drawings and build it according to the different ones. Anything that would not match that drawing that was presented by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would be rejected. This is what Allah wants. He told us very clearly, this is what I want. مَنْ يُطَعِ الرَّسُولَ فَقَدْ أَطَاعَ اللَّهِ If you obey the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم, you have obeyed Allah. You got any other design, any other drawing, any other way of life, everything is rejected. This is why Umar رضي الله عنه in his khutbah, again and again he used to remind people, all oh people, please vent your life, on the book of Allah and on the Sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And if you see it sitting there, this is what Allah wants. And if you see that things are different, you should know that it's rejected by Allah. Allah is not going to prove it for sure. Don't be too late to find out that your drawing, your home is being rejected. We don't build a house that is against these approved drawings. Because we don't want to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars and at the end you have to demolish it. And this is what will happen. Try to build a house. Build a five-story building in a neighborhood which is residential. And I will tell you, regardless of how many millions you have to spend, we don't care. It was your fault that you built this type of apartment building in this area. You tell them I have five children, I want one apartment for each of my children. We don't want to hear no story. Take the house down. Take this building down. That's it. This is all what we want to see. We don't know anything else. Now we would go over there and find out that, oh, I built this because of my children. I built all of these five stories because I thought my children would live around me. For the sake of my children, for the sake of my business, for the sake of my own, my family's, uh, uh, my, my family's pleasure, I built this. That's what kind of a was so This was the drawing that was presented to you. It's, it goes against it, take it back. It's not accepted over here. May you say about Surah, Fakad Allah. If you have obeyed the messenger from Allah, why you tell them, you have obeyed Allah. And if a person is trying to convince himself that I'm pleasing the law by going against the ways of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but no, I'm doing my salah, so Allah is pleased. No. Quran is telling us no. This is not happening. The only way Allah would be pleased is when we please Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and when we follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes further in these ayahs to tell us وَمَنْ تَوَلَّهُ فَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ عَلَيْهِمْ حَفِيظًا O Muhammad, if anyone turns away from your teaching, from your way of life, from your sunnah, we have not sent you to be the guardian over them. Let them do whatever they want. Don't worry about them anymore. وَيَقُولُونَ طَاعًا During the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there was a group of people that were called Munafiqeen. And we read again and again about that group in Quran al Karim. That group of people, they wanted to present themselves as the true followers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
But in reality, in their heart, they had not accepted the full of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a true messenger of Allah. Since these people wanted to present themselves as true believers, so what they were doing was, during the daytime, they would come to the Messiah. They would do everything as the rest of the Sahaba and one Allah alayhi wa would do. At the end of the day, when they go back to their homes, the lifestyle would be totally different than what the other Sahaba 